Our church grew this year 2%. That was you. Sometimes the neighbor is not afraid to be prayed for. We are afraid to pray with them. We pay you. You got to. She's going to die. She needs spiritual encouragement. When people pray for one another, it builds unity between them. But God's logic is always crazy. I'm going to start with a story, and then we continue. Um, there was this little group. There was this little group in Vietnam. Um, they didn't have a church. In fact, in fact, they met in somebody's house. And I want to say, because some of you may be tempted to think, if the church doesn't get together, we don't have a chance because we are too few. That's not real. Jesus doesn't say whenever the whole church gets together. In fact, Ellen White says, don't wait for the church to come together. All of it, it will never happen, she says. I have the quotation in the present. It will never, if you wait for everybody, <laughs> he will keep waiting. <laughs> Jesus says whenever two or three. In my former church, after preaching more or less several months on prayer, we organized prayer groups. And I never managed to get everybody at the church on Wednesday night not because they were bad people, but some of them live far. Some of them have evening jobs. But I asked them to pray. And then I talked to them one-to-one. -one. I went to a girl that she was a, a physician, and I said, you believe in prayer? Yes. I said, can you organize a prayer group? Because you told me you work in shift. You cannot come always Wednesday. She said, yes. And I said, don't you think that you have to organize a prayer group only with SDAs? That's our belief. <clears throat> That's wrong. We are afraid to pray for the neighbor or with the neighbor. But sometimes the neighbor is not afraid to be prayed for. We are afraid to pray with them. Do you follow me? We are more afraid to approach them than they are afraid to be approached. Yes. <laughs> what if they say no? And what? They say no and that's it. What do you lose? And so I talked to her. Invite the neighbors. And I said, okay. What she did, she started every Friday night a group with nurses and doctors in her house. And also one at the hospital. And then I talked to a teacher, young guy, chemistry teacher. He invited the students at his house. And then I talked to a lady, retired, tall, very kind, very smart, very dedicated, involved in the church. I talked to her and she says, done. She invited all the retired people from the church and it impressed me. I mean, the retired group was so big. And they came Monday morning at her house and they prayed. And by the way, two, three months later, they started to invite me because once a month they would go out and eat. Pastor, you know that you love food. Come with us. <clears throat> I never said no. Anyway. <laughs> and so we had, to make the, the long story short, seven different groups praying in homes in different times, different days. Plus the group at the church. Eight all together. But when you have eight groups, in the smallest one, I would say, 10 people praying in the biggest one, maybe over 20, 30. That's a lot of people praying. And when you have groups praying all over, those groups will never be the same. Because people who pray together, the more you pray together, the closer you get to one another. When people pray for one another, it builds unity between them. And those groups became families. And when you get close to one another and close to God, it changes everything in your life. And then the whole church started to change. And it started with prayer groups. But it was in homes. So the question is, why are you afraid to start a prayer group in your home? Just try it. I did that in my previous, before the last one, district. And we started literally one group in my house because everybody, I don't know how to do it. You don't need to know. You just pray. There's no, you know, just pray. <clears throat> started in my house. We started about six, seven, eight. In short time, we had about 15, 20. 
And when you have too many, what happens? People don't open anymore. Don't feel comfortable to open. So we split the group, and the new baptized lady, her husband was still in the world, running a golf course, very well-to-do family. She took half of the group. I asked her, I said, would you want to run a prayer group in your home? Now you have been watching, you know how to do it. She said, yes. She took half of the group in her home. But they, her group, because she knew a lot of non-Adventists. I didn't. But she just, she was baptized freshly. So she knew a lot of non-Adventists. So she invited all those ladies that were her neighbors and friends. Her group exploded. So she had to split the group again. And so one nurse from the church took half of this lady's group and they grew. And then one of the elders of the church took half of the nurse group and they grew. And then the treasurer of the church took half of the elders group and they grew. And so I don't give you the names, but if you talk to one of those people, I could, if you really want to talk to them, I could give you a telephone you can call. They grew in so many groups that the church eventually had several groups praying. And it didn't happen in one day. You need to understand, this takes time. It happened within, let's say, one year and a half to two years. But when the church was praying, the church changed. And it was a church that had trouble for many, 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 many years. That church moved 17 pastors in 21 years. None of them stayed two years. I was nine years there in that church. But I want to make a point. When the church prayed, the church was changed. It really, transformation happened. It really happened. <clears throat> Going back, in Vietnam, you remember how we started? <clears throat> in Vietnam, there was a small group praying in a house. They didn't even have a church. The group was so small. I don't know how many. Ten? I don't have that piece of information. But they met together in Han's house to pray. And they talked. You probably know the story. They talked. And as they talked, they said, <clears throat> we pray, but we lose our children. Because our children, none of them are baptized. None of them are in the church. And they work in the big city, not here in the village. <clears throat> and in the big city that was 150 kilometers, not miles, that's roughly probably 90 miles, more or less, 80, 90 miles. 150 kilometers north in the big city, their children had jobs. And they said, our children are in the city working there. <clears throat> they don't have a church. There is no Adventist church. There is no Adventist presence. There is not one Adventist member in the whole city. Our kids work there, live there, and they have no church to go. <clears throat> so what do we do <clears throat> to save our kids? So I want to ask you, if you would pray for a city that is 150 kilometers away, how can you make a difference if you are not there? Do you see? Well, this is an example of what prayer does. How powerful prayer is. When Jesus told us to pray together, he knew that there is power in prayer. They got together in Hans' house and they prayed for about six months without anything happening. And eventually, an old lady, Yen, got baptized. She had terminal cancer, fourth stage, and she died. <laughs> now, you and me would say, God doesn't really do a good job. Because he could have baptized somebody young, healthy, could, who could do evangelism or Bible studies. But this lady, <clears throat> old, cancer, died. What's the benefit to be baptized if, if she's unable to do some ministry? You see, that's my logic. But God's logic is always crazy. Now, don't you think that I offend God? When I say it's always crazy, it's crazy for our mind. Because when God works, it never makes sense. I mean, if God would tell you to go to war with the light and the trumpet, isn't that crazy? If God would tell you to build an ark and you were Noah and there was never rain, isn't that crazy? 
it God would tell Elijah to go before the king that was looking for him to kill him. Why would I do that? To be killed? Would you have the courage to go before the king when the king is actually looking for you to kill you? When God works, it doesn't make sense. And that's one of the reasons you need to pray. Because if you don't pray and God would ask you to do something, you will not get it and you will not do it. You need to pray enough so God prepares you for a big plan. Because otherwise, we go to God, sadly, with small prayers. Because we are afraid he's not going to answer. So we pray and then we do it. We pray just small things that we can do. And then we do it and we say, God answered. No, it was your plan and you answered. And that's the reason we get small results. Our church grew this year 2%. That was you. If God works, our church grew this year 150%. You follow me? God doesn't have small plans because God is not small. We are small. And Ellen White says, interestingly, she says that God expects us to pray big prayers. The word is not big. The word she uses there is, you know, to pray for great results. And we pray very small because we are afraid it's not going to happen. I don't have the courage because if I pray and it doesn't happen, what are people going to say about me, you know? So I better don't pray big. I pray small. And then I'm safe. (laughs) You follow me? And so... This is going back. This group prayed for that city, 150 kilometers north. After six months, the old lady, Yen, got baptized, but she had terminal cancer. And they talk, and they say, now we need to take care of her. She's our member. So what do we do? They call the neighbor. Hey, are you so-and-so? Yeah. Are you the neighbor? Yeah. We need to hire you to do a job for us. What? We want you to take care of her. We pay you. How much do you pay me? They negotiate, get a done deal. And she says, what do you want me to do? And they say, we want you to do shopping for her, to do cooking, to feed her because she is in bed. She can only not even walk. To feed her, to clean her. We want you, you follow me, clean the house. And we want you to read the Bible for her. And the lady says, I am an agnostic. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in anything. I don't believe in religion. I don't want to read the Bible. And they say, we don't care. It's a job. We pay you to read for her, not for you. You don't have to believe. But she's dizzy. She cannot read. We want you to read. And she says, but I really don't like religion. Hey, you don't have to like it. We pay you to do it. Okay. What should I read? Bible promises to give her hope. Where are the Bible promises? In the Bible. Where? Well, most of them in Psalm. Where is Psalm? In the middle. She takes the Bible of the neighbor. She opens. Yeah, I found Psalm. This is big. So many chapters. What? Do you want me to read the whole thing? No, read some promises. Which one? For instance, read Psalm 30. She says, where is Psalm 30? After 29, obviously. (coughs) Okay. And they say, okay, you take care of her. Yeah, we are going to pay you. Next week they call. Did you take care of her? Yes. Did you shop? Yes. Did you feed her? Yes. Did you give her a shower? Yes. Did you read the Bible? No. Why not? Because I don't believe. We don't care what you believe. We pay you. You got to. She's going to die. She needs spiritual encouragement. Read the Bible for her before she dies. Okay. The lady died. The doctors come to take her body. They check her vitals. They say she's dead. And before they take her, the neighbor says, hold on. They are going to call me and they are going to ask me if I read the Bible before she died. And I didn't. And this is the ritual Adventists do, she says. Muslims do this and that. Catholics do the mass before people die. Adventists read Psalm 30 before people die. (laughs) He says, I got to do the ritual. When they call me, I say, I did it. And she takes the Bible, opens Psalm 30 and starts. What is the benefit if I die? Can the dead praise you? But you raised me from the pit of death. You got my soul out. And while she's reading, the dead lady starts moving. Wait. (laughs) The dead lady comes back. 
Not only she comes back from the dead, but totally cancer-free. No trace of cancer. The neighbor starts screaming, the ritual has power. <coughs> this ritual has power. And the lady starts going from home to home, the neighbor in the whole town, from home to home, saying, I need to do the ritual for you. <laughs> Reading Psalm 30, Bible reading from home to home. And she says, if I read it for you, this is going to change your life. It has power. It has power. It can change your life. It can heal you. It can resurrect you. It can transform you. Let me do the ritual for your house. And she goes from house to house. 50 people get baptized. And later it gets to 100, and later to 150, and later to 200. A new church is planted in that city. Why? Because a group of people 150 kilometers away keep Praying. One of the pastors, one of my friends told me the story. He had been there himself. He had talked to the group. I was not there. I'm, I'm, this is second hand. I tell the story the way I heard it. But prayer works. I give you one more example and then we continue with our subject. One more example. <clears throat> I was... I don't even know how many years ago I was preaching and, uh, in Paris and an old lady was listening to my sermons. And then, <clears throat> obviously, I left. I traveled quite a lot. And the lady called me. And I get many phone calls, sometimes too many. And the lady said, what can I do for my kids? None of them in the church. My grandchildren, none of them in the church. They don't want to hear about God. <clears throat> they don't want to come to church. They don't want to read books. They just have zero interest in religion. What would you tell her? Because she asked me, should I ask again? When they don't want to hear, the more you ask, the more they turn you off. In fact, they can tell you, hey, if you talk again, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. <clears throat> so I said, lady... Jesus gives you the answer. Whenever two or three get two other ladies that you know that they are dedicated to prayer, that love prayer, <clears throat> get in your house and pray together that the Holy Spirit, because you cannot change your family, the Holy Spirit would change your family. Yeah. And the lady got other ladies, they prayed together, but nothing happened. <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me, I talked too much today. And the lady called me again. And I really don't like when people call me again for the same question. Ask me a new question. If, you, if I answered you and you asked me the same question, it means you didn't listen. <laughs> so she's asking me, say, how long should we pray? I said, lady, I already gave you the answer. You either didn't listen or you didn't like what I said. I said, keep praying. She says, how long? I said, just keep praying. And she says, you don't tell me how long. I said, no, because you already know the answer. You should never stop until Jesus comes. What if nothing happens? Well, at least you know that you kept praying, because if you don't pray, it's your fault. <laughs> she was like, okay. And she didn't call me back. She really got the message, I, you know. And so she didn't call me back. But then I, I got invited to go to France to speak for ASI. And that was last year. And I go there, and the lady comes to me. And the lady hugs me <clears throat> and starts crying. And she says, you don't know what happened. I said, you never call me. She says, well, you are too busy to be called. <laughs> People don't call me to tell me the results. They call me when they have a need, you know. And so she, I said, what happened? And she calls her grandson, the one she was praying for. And he comes, and he got, hugs me. And he says, you see these people? There were roughly, I would say, 700 people listening. About 100 to 150, I don't know the number, he brought to church. And then he told me the story. He said that he was in Baha'i, whatever that is, and he was into drugs. And he never wanted to hear about Christianity or Bible. And his grandma, after they prayed in a small group, his grandma felt inspired to ask him to translate some sermons in French. And she said, I'm not asking you to come to church. I'm not asking you to believe. 
I'm asking you to translate them in French because they are in English, put subtitles, and upload them back on YouTube. That's all I am asking you. But I don't like it. Hey, you keep asking for money. I told you you need to do something to deserve the money. You need to work for it. So you said, I don't want to mow your grass anymore. You don't have to mow the grass. You translate the sermons. They had a deal how much he will be paid per sermon. And he started to translate sermons. He told me literally after 16 sermons, he got baptized. But when he got baptized, he was so on fire for God that he could not help himself. He went to his drug friends. And he said, you need to listen to this. This is going to change your life. It has changed my life. And they said, you lost your mind. We don't believe in God. We don't care. We have no interest in listening to the sermons. I said, hey, folks, you know me. I want you to listen one minute. One minute. And if you don't like it, don't ever listen again. One minute is not going to kill you. One minute. They agreed. After they listened, they listened to another and another and another and another sermon. 230 people got baptized from this old lady. And this is not in Africa. This is not in Brazil. This is in Paris. Very secular. France is very secular. 230. She said to me, she said, not only the 230 some that got baptized from this man, from this young man that translated the sermons among his non adventist drug friends, but there are another two, three hundred that are taking Bible studies ready for baptism right now because an old lady was praying all the time. Isn't that something? And I could give you more stories, so you don't have time for it. I want to... <clears throat> Emphasize a few things. When you go to church, is it good or bad? It's good, obviously. When you go to church, we have a tendency, Elena says, talking in the Christ Object Lesson page, uh, I believe I could be wrong, wrong, 400. It's not 400. I'm going to tell you what page it is. Give me one second. Um... Christ Object Lessons. I will find it right away. No worries. Okay. 408. Page 408 to 411 in Christ Object Lesson. Uh, when you go to church, she says there that when we go to church, I put it in my words. When we study, when we pray, when we do all the good things that we do, she says we have a tendency to replace Christ's righteousness with our own righteousness. I don't know if you follow. It's a little confusing so far, but I'm going to break it down for you. We, she says we have a tendency when we do all this good stuff, what is good, we should do it, to replace his righteousness with our own righteousness. And then she says, doing all these forms that are necessary and good gives us a sense of safety that we have done our duty. A sense of we have done what we are required to do, we are okay. And she says, we replace God's presence with God's doctrine and forms. And we have a tendency to think that if we do all the forms, it means we have the presence. And we think we are okay. And we don't know that we don't have God. And we are far from God. And when he comes, he says, I don't know you. I want you to think about the ten virgins. I'm not going to give the sermon, but I'm going to give you the summary. Ten virgins. Why ten? Why not twelve? Like the apostles. Why not seven? Like Sabbath, holy number. Why ten? Why ten? Because in Israel, when priests were taken to the temple to serve, were taken in groups of ten. Always, when the shift would change for the next period, Ten would come in and ten would go out. And when they would say a group of ten, Israel mindset 
new. It's about serving God. So to begin with, the ten virgins are about service. That's the, back, that's the foundation. We talk about service. Jesus says ten virgins. Okay, service. Now he says they are virgins. What does he mean, virgins? Clean, pure. So we don't talk about the prostitute woman from Revelation, the apostate church. We talk about the clean church, the virgin. You follow me? Because in the Revelation there are two churches, two women. One in white, virgin, and one in red, scarlet, uh, on the beast. You, re you remember? So we talk about ten virgins are who? God's church called to serve. I don't know if you follow me. God's church called to serve. You are not called to be saved. You are not called to be saved. You are called to serve. And to the degree that you serve, you are saved. God didn't call Israel to save Israel. God called everybody to save. God loved the entire world so nobody should perish. God called Israel to service. And then why says they are not rejected because of their sins. They are rejected because they refused to serve. Illinois says that they were called to serve and they closed themselves within walls and the others were unwelcome, unclean. While they were called to be a blessing to all nations, to the, to the Gentiles. Their house was supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. They closed themselves from the nations and they rejected, as Illinois says, they were called to be a light to a perishing world. They were called to be a light. They were called to be a light. Jesus says you are the light of the world. They refused to be missionaries to the world. And she says, that's the reason God rejected them. And God called us, the church, to be a light. God gave us the great commission. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. Okay. And so, ten virgins called to serve. They are the church because they are virgins. They are dressed in white. What is that? Christ robe of righteousness. They have the lamps. What is that? It's more than that. Psalm, 100, Psalm 119 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. However, Proverbs chapter 6, you better read that one. Because Proverbs chapter 6 says, The law, it's a lamp, and the commandments are the light. Quote. Proverbs chapter 6 says that what is the light? The law. What church has the commandments? Pretty clear. So we talk about God's church here. They have the lamp. They have the commandments. They have Christ's righteousness. They are waiting for the groom to come. What church is waiting? Obvious. Okay. And then we talk about the parable. And we talk about the virgins falling asleep. How many of them fall asleep? All. Ellen White says, listen carefully. By the sleeping church by the sleeping disciples, is represented a sleeping church. In gospel workers. Is represented a sleeping church before the second coming, she says. By the sleeping disciples, is represented a sleeping church before the second coming. When Christ is at the door, and to sleep, she says, is dangerous. Is dangerous. And then she says, pastors have no power to wake them up. Because she says, pastors themselves sleep too. And then she says, the funny sentence. Sleeping pastors preaching to sleeping members. She says that. Did you know that? In fact, I could give you the quotation. Uh, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Look here. Sleeping ministers preaching to sleeping people. Have you read that? Gospel Workers 121? Preaching to sleeping people. Isn't that amazing? And so let me ask you. Sleeping members, sleeping, preaching to, pastors preaching to sleeping people. Let me ask you. Do you have a feeling that I am sleeping? No. Are you sleeping? No, you are not. I'm talking to you. If you are sleeping, you will be like, you know, you are not sleeping. So what is this? Because we are not sleeping. And she, How many virgins were sleeping? All. All. But we are not sleeping. So what does he mean? What does he mean? Uh, she actually talks about it. But I'm, I'm going to just... I don't have time to go through the paragraphs. She says that Satan is trying to keep us ignorant to the 
urgency of the events as we are asleep to the urgency of the events so we don't prepare. Look around. Is it not urgent? Is it not clear that Jesus is coming? Yet, how many people of our people do prepare? Let me put it this way. It's not comfortable. You probably don't like me anymore. That's okay. Don't call me back. Listen. Listen. We hate to move out of the cities. Don't we? I was preaching in a church, and I told them, you need to pray. Elena, I says, pray about opportunities to be in a small town, not in big cities. I was talking in a big city, big city, big city. And I said, to move outside the city. And so somebody came to me, a doctor, I'm not going to tell you where or who, and said, Pastor, please, please, don't. Now I got it. Move to Templeton. Yes, because you have a garden. And so he says to me, the doctor says to me, please don't preach this anymore. Can you believe that? A doctor came to me, please don't preach this anymore. I said, why not? And he said, Pastor, I do know that we have to move, but not now. I have a job, it's important, and it's not comfortable to give up my job and move. I said, who told you to give up your job? I told you to pray about it. I don't, what if every Adventist would give up their jobs and they all move in the same time? Do you think that's wise? Elena says that everyone would move in the time that God inspires them to move. And she says, you pray and God is going to inspire you when and where. And you need to wait upon the Lord. And I said, I told you to pray. I didn't tell you to give up your job. You don't listen to my sermon, I said. And so people are not comfortable with that. So what they want, they don't want to hear it. Please don't tell me about it. That's crazy. Anyway, and so she says that Satan tries to keep us ignorant to the urgency of the events so we don't prepare. And then it's going to be a surprise when Jesus comes that we are not prepared. It's like you go to Olympics and you are so busy that you don't prepare and the night before the Olympics you want to develop muscles. It's too late. You don't prepare for the war the night before the war. It's too late. And so going back, the ten virgins are sleeping. I have another theory. Besides what Ellen White says, that sleeping is being ignorant of the events that you live in, and we are ignorant. In fact, I hear people saying, when I see the crisis, I'm going to move and prepare. Are you kidding me? When I see the crisis, look around! And you see the crisis. But people expect the crisis as something new. And they fail to see that crisis come as the labors, the pregnancy labors. That's what the Bible says. Pregnancy labors don't come instantly. They come gradually. My wife, when she gave birth, I remember, we were in Bucharest, and she had a little tingle. Oh, I felt something. And then two hours later, boop, again. And then two hours later, boop, again. And then one hour later, it was a little stronger, more painful and longer. And then one hour later, and then half an hour later, you, you, you get it? And it was more closer to one another in frequency, longer in length, and stronger in intensity, gradually increasing to the degree that she had continual pain. But this grows gradually. You are not going to see the events, the crisis, instantly. No fires, no tornadoes, no pandemics, and instantly one million catastrophes. They started already. You look in the last 50 years, and you see as they gradually, as the labors have been growing, and because it happens in time, we got used to it. And we think it's normal. And we live in the crisis, and we don't prepare because we say, when the crisis comes, Hello, wake up. We live in the crisis. You follow me? And so people wait to see a miracle in order to prepare. Don't wait for a miracle. Miracles are already happening. You, you, just, you just don't see it. <laughs> and so going back, uh, sleeping also means that you are absolutely blind to what happens around you. You follow me? Absolutely. I mean, I talk to family that were neighbors to my son, that they are non-Christians, zero. And I talk to them as neighbors. I went to them and I gave them garden produce. And they say to me, Pastor, 
We know you are a pastor, so we want to talk to you because you don't have anybody to talk with. And they don't go to any church, zero. They don't believe in anything. And they say, we think the end of the world is coming. No, Adventists tell me that. We think the end of the world is coming. The way it goes cannot last any longer. If they see it and our members don't see it, then they are snoring, I'm sorry. And so going back, what else means sleeping? Can it be when Jesus was in the boat during the storm and the disciples were desperate and Jesus was sleeping, Ellen White says, he was safe in the Father's hands. He was safe. When Peter was in prison, he was sleeping. And then anyway, he says in the book of Acts that he knew that God is in control and he is safe. Can it also be that sleeping means a sense of safety? We are God's people. We have the truth. Do you hear that among us? We have the truth. We are safe. A sense of safety. Because we are Adventists. We have the health you know, message, we have the Sabbath, we have the commandments, we are the church, and we have a sense of safety. Can it be? And that makes us sleep, because hey, we are okay. We don't need to wake up. And in fact, we need to wake up as much as the others. Do you follow me? So the, now, the parable says that the virgins were sleeping, all of them. And then the parable says that the groom, the, her, the, the sound, the, the call was, the groom is coming. What is that? The call, the cry. What is that? Ellen White says that God allows crisis as a cry to wake us up. God allows crisis to wake us up because he's, she says God doesn't do anything without warning the church to prepare. Before every event, there was something like Noah before the flood. You follow me? Something clear to wake them up so they will not perish. Okay. Now, it says how many virgins, how many of them woke up? Including the foolish? So if you watch, Elena says in Christ Object Lesson, page 411, she says there is no difference between them in the church. They all fall asleep, they all wake up. And this is the key right here. When they woke up, what did they do? The Bible says they went to trim their lamps. What does it tell you to trim their lamps? They don't know that they don't have oil. You would not trim your lamp if you knew that there is no oil. Am I right? So they think that they are okay. To the last moment, they are blind in the church that they are not okay. Am I right? And when they want to trim their lamps, finally, they realize, oops, <laughs> we have a problem. <laughs> and so, what's the difference between the five and the other five? What's the difference? The Holy Spirit is the oil. The lamp is the form that holds the oil. They have the lamp, they don't have the oil. They have all the forms, they don't have the presence. That's the difference. They all have the forms. And they feel confident because they have the forms. But they don't have the presence. Why? Because in the beginning they all had oil, didn't they? And slowly, she says, slowly, slowly, in time, slowly went down, lower and lower, lower. Still oil, lower and lower and lower. And they fell asleep, lower and lower and lower. So this is what is the difference between saved and lost. 20 years ago when they got baptized, they all went to prayer and study of the world. But they got busy. Job and this and that, they got busy. And five of them don't go back to refill the container every day with God's presence. They get busy and they count on the experience they had 20 years ago. They don't have a new experience today. They don't refill the container every day. The other five, the wise, daily they go to prayer and study and daily they focus on Christ and his sacrifice and daily they surrender and daily they fill themselves with the Holy Spirit and daily they take it so serious as it was the last day before Jesus comes or they would die today. They daily commit themselves again. That's how they have the container daily filled up. You follow me? 
and that's where they fail. I remember, for those who heard my sermons, I give this story. I was, in, I was 17. I, I was young. I was at the Black Sea in Romania with the youth. The pastor took 25, 26, 27 young men to the Black Sea camping. And this is the sea and then uh, the, the city. And then it's a lake called Eforia North Lake. Actually, no, that's the city. It's called Tekirgyol. That lake is gigantic. That lake, it's 5, 6 kilometers wide and 10, 11 kilometers long. And people try to cross the lake and they die. You know why? Because you don't see what direction you go. They get from the shore, as you go down the sand and get in the water, you see the other end, this city is Eforia North, and the other city is Eforia South. From this city, you see that city, the homes you see so small. You don't see people or trees. It's so far. When you get in the lake, there is always wind. And because of the wind, there are waves. When you get among waves, you don't see too far. And after you swim 10, 15 minutes, you don't see anything, any direction except water. And it takes you five, six hours to cross the lake swimming. And after you swim one hour, you don't know if you go straight or you go in circles. And you swim two hours, and then you wonder, am I going to ever go? Am I going in circles? And you swim three hours, and you give up, and you die. So I, when the pastor said, who is going to cross the lake? Who is brave? I called my dad. I said, how do I finish the race? And my father said to me, it's not enough to start the race. Many people start the race. It's like you go to school, not good enough. You need to graduate. <laughs> he said, you must finish the race. I said, I know. How do you do that? And my father said, you need to stay focused. Don't let anything distract you. Stay focused. You need to have one, not two, one goal. And don't let anything distract you. Not life, not death, no nothing. No people talking. Don't talk to anybody. Don't. One goal. I said, how do you do that? He said, fix your mind on the goal. I said, okay. We got in the water. The pastor and two other adults took three canoes. So the young people who get tired would get in canoes so they would not die. And we started. And I remember, I'm not going to tell you his name, a big guy, big muscles, a Schwarzenegger, you know. He said, oh, I can't get it. I said, okay. Me? I was like this, slim, no muscles. And then was another guy. Uh, he was a Rambo. Oh, I can do it, you know, not so, not so strong like the first one. And I remember them getting in the water and, choo, 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 and shoo, fast. Me, I started to sing. <laughs> to impose myself a rhythm. And I would not look to them. I would not listen to them. I was... And I was slow going, singing and going, singing and going. And they went fast, and then they got tired and they stopped. And they stopped, and they started to chat a little, hold themselves by the boats, you know, by the canoes. And I got from behind, and I was going. And they said, take a break with us. What do you think that I said? I didn't talk. I didn't care. And then I went farther and farther, and they say, hey, Pavel got far away, let's, let's go. And they got in the water, <laughs> and they caught me from behind, but you're already exhausted, and they stopped again. That's what we do in Christianity. We have a big push, and then we stop, and then we get discouraged, and then we get a big push. I was like, <laughs> continue. After they did that two, three times, one by one, they got in the boat. And they said to me, hey, you and your friend are alone in the water. Get in the boat. What do you think I answered? I didn't answer. And then the pastor said, Pavel, you are going to die in the water. If we go, you are going to die. And we cannot wait for you. Get in the boat. What do you think I said? Nothing. I was deaf. And eventually he got up and said, Hey, we can no longer wait for you. You are too slow. You want to get in the boat? And I did say, Leave me alone. You are going to die. I said, Happy to die. Go. They left because they knew that I'm crazy, so they left. 
They were on the other side, eating, having fun. Five hours later, I got there. When I got there, I ate a little, I got an orange juice, and then they said, okay, let's go in the boat and go back. I jumped in the water and <whistles> another five hours. So tell me how. This is what the five foolish don't understand. They think if they go to church, if they have the forms, the lamps, if they keep the commandments and eat that good tofu, and if they do Sabbath school, and if they go to camp meeting, and if they don't work on Saturday, and if they uh, don't cheat on their spouse and pay their taxes, and, and, and know the 2,300 days and night prophecy and the state of the dead, they think they are okay. You follow me? They know the doctrines, and they keep the Sabbath, and they keep the commandments. They must be okay. Well, let me tell you the bad news. Pharisees knew the doctrines. Pharisees kept the commandments. Am I right? You should keep the commandments, but if you don't have the presence, exactly what the virgins did, you miss the point. And the five foolish confuse relationship with God with forms. And they build their own righteousness instead of being based on God's presence righteousness. And they fool themselves. And when Jesus comes, they want to trim the lamb. They say, oh, Jesus, we've been going to church. He says, I don't know you. That's bad words to hear. Really bad words. Because they fail to do the most simple thing. Daily refill your container with oil. And being destitute of oil is being lost. Being destitute of God's presence. Hear, hear really carefully. Because this is what we all know and very few do. Destitute of God's presence. Ellen White talks about this. Calls it Omega Crisis. She says at the end, we'll have programs, all type of events, but not God's presence. This is big. Now going back. <clears throat> Talking about, um, about the virgins and God's presence, the oil. This is what we really need to get. God's presence doesn't happen overnight. It's not something that you instantly have. It's a lifelong process. The closer you get to him, the more you know him, the more you love him, the more you trust him, the more you need him, the more you desire him, because when you love him and understand him, you want more of him. The more you study, the more you pray, then the more you know him, and it never ends to the degree that slowly, by spending time with him, you become like him. Because what Ellen White says, whatever your mind dwells upon, that's what you become. If your mind is focused on politics, you become politically fervent, extremist. If your mind is focused on business, your mind, your whole life, your time, your energy is going to go into business. But if your mind dwells on Christ and his sacrifice daily, you'll be transformed to the degree that without you trying to change yourself, you are going to become more and more like him to the degree that people will know that you are spending time with him. And so this is simple. This is no theology. This is no Greeks and Hebrew and complicated stuff. This is simple. Yet, we don't do it. Now probably you do it. Praise the Lord if you do. There is always room for us to keep growing. We should never stop. And so this is what we need to get. If you really want, I tell you from my experience, when I am tired, I come from a trip, and I ignore to study seriously and to pray seriously one day, that day I fail. My temper comes back, and you think after so many years, probably it's not there anymore. It's no longer in me. Well, wrong. M my wife says to me, man, you can be patient for three years, and then if you don't study, you lose your temper. <laughs> It's still there. My nature is, until Jesus comes, my nature, terrible nature is still there. And I don't get angry with my wife. Never. 
That would be a biggest mistake. I'll never be happy again. I don't get angry with my wife. I know to give up anything. With my wife, I just say, whatever you want, honey, kiss her, and I am the happiest person in the earth. But I lose my temper with my kids and people around. And so then I lose. But when I have my devotional time, not as a duty, but quality time seeking to be filled with God's presence, when I have my devotional, it just doesn't happen. People can bother me. I just don't get upset. More than that, when I have my devotional, my kids behave. Yes. And when I don't have it, they go crazy. Because God's presence comes when I have my devotional, not only me, over me. It comes over my whole family. And I can see God's presence in the life of the kids and their families. We, it's our duty as parents to be so prayerful that we make sure that our families are baptized with the Holy Spirit. We are sure. And then I says it's the duty of the parents to pray for God's presence and blessing over the kids. It's our duty to make sure that we are immersed in God's presence. This is not new stuff, folks. But it's God's call for you to do it. More than that, when you pray, you get used with God's voice. The more you pray, the more you know God. You learn how he works. You learn how he talks. And then you have an open ear, an open eye. When God says do something, you hear it. And God can use you. I'm going to give you an example. Jerry and Janet are going to know right away who I am talking about. I was at work at the office long ago. In the second year after I was called at the GC, I was in the office. And for me, food is holy. Food and Sabbath, I never break them. And so I was in the office and my wife prepared a nice sandwich. And I always have with me an apple, a banana, a sandwich. I always, if you go in my office, I have soups. The one that you got me. I have those miso or pho or I have soups in the drawer. You pull the drawer, people have books. Me? Food. You, <laughs> I have soups and I have granola bars and I have fruits and I have juices and I have, it's full of food. And I'm happy and I don't feel guilty, guilty about it. Hey, I love food, you know. But anyway, and so I go to my office. My wife prepared a sandwich and the sandwich was amazing. Tomatoes from the garden, they have taste. And it, cucumber and tomatoes and I, I remember the sandwich. And as I was contemplating to eat my sandwich, it was around 10 o'clock, I got to pray. My father used to say when I would pray when I was a kid, yeah, my mom's cow never prayed when she ate. <laughs> my father would say to me, and I said, oh, I felt terrible. Okay. So I looked to my sandwich. I said, I got to pray. So I pray over the sandwich. Lord, please bless this wonderful food. And please fill me. I do that periodically. Have you done this? Have you programmed your alarm clock on your cell phone to remind you to pray? I did that. It vibrates every two hours. And I don't stop for two hours. I stop for a few seconds. If I forget about God, to refresh my mind, to spend a few seconds, to make sure that I don't depart too far from him. And Elena says, if we discipline, she says, if we discipline ourselves to periodically remember, to reconnect, she says, we are going to get used to stay connected. So what I did... I had my phone vibrate every two hours. And it was two hours, it was 10 o'clock, it was time to eat. I said, you know, I'm going to do both. I pray for the food and I prayed. I said, Lord, open my eyes to be so connected that you can control me. And God impressed me. And you, you start to know God's voice. God said, go to your secretary, give her your food. That's a no-no. My food, <laughs> my food is my food, you know, period. Don't touch it. So I said, Lord, I was kind of thinking, talking to God, we are not in Cuba. She doesn't need food. She will be offended. I'm not going to give her my food. <laughs> and God impressed me. Didn't you ask me to control you, to lead you? Go to your secretary and give her your food. And I said, Lord, can I give her only half? <laughs> and, and God stopped talking. So I felt terrible that I am negotiating with God. I said, okay. So I go around to her, you know, cubicle to her place. And she's never sleeping. I mean, I do find her talking to people, but never sleeping. 
she was with her head on her desk. 10 o'clock, sleeping, I've never seen that before. So I said, hey, how are you doing? And she didn't move. She didn't move. So I got a little scared. I said, are you okay? And she just did that. Said, Oops. Should I call 911? She did that. I didn't know what to I said, I came to give you my food. Hoping that she says I don't need it. She got her hand. She took the sandwich. She got her head up, took a bite, and then put her head down on the desk. It was the longest minute I had ever experienced because she was not eating. I was watching her with, her with my sandwich in her mouth, not chewing, you know. And she keeps my sandwich in her mouth, and then after a minute, she starts chewing a little. It was not a minute, but it was for me, you know. And then she takes another bite, and she doesn't talk to me, and I was like, what's going on? And after a few bites, she gets up and she says, I was born with diabetes, as you know, and I have a palm that drops insulin, and the pump broke, and I didn't know. And she said, my sugar went high, 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 and I did myself an insulin. And my sugar, choo, 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 low, 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 low. And she said, I felt dizzy, so I measured. It was 32. And she said, I wanted to get up, and I fell down on my chair, and I had no strength to get up. And she said, I wanted to call somebody, and I had no more strength. And I put my head on my desk, and I prayed that God would send somebody with some food so my sugar goes up. Isn't that something? What if I didn't pray or I didn't listen? Do you follow me? When you continually reconnect and make it a priority wherever you are, whatever you do, to stay connected, filled by the Spirit, God is going to be in the business of talking to you. And God doesn't talk always. Because people tell me, oh, I've been praying for two weeks and God didn't talk. God talks when there is a need. But if you don't listen, then it's sad. Anyway, going back, I want to emphasize that the Holy Spirit is given, Jesus says, to lead us in how many things? How much means all? All. What is that? If you remember, the Bible says, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit, listen, is going to convince the world of what? Sin, righteousness, and judgment. What is that? Have you ever asked yourself what is that? The Holy Spirit is going to convince the world of sin. What is that? When you are convinced of sin, that's called repentance or justification. Ellen White explains it. The Holy Spirit is what brings conviction to turn our life around and to accept Jesus. That's when you are convinced of sin, give up sin, and get baptized. But then the Holy Spirit convinces you of righteousness. What is that? That's sanctification. Justification, when you, are, when you leave the world, get baptized, join the church, give your life to Jesus. And this is where we fail. We have the tendency to think that when we got baptized, I gave my life to Jesus. No, you didn't. You just made the decision to give your life to Jesus, but your life is as miserable as before. You just made the decision. Because when you are born, that's not the end of the story. That's the beginning of the story. You are supposed to grow from baby to the statue of fullness of Christ. You are supposed to grow from milk to heavy food. And people get baptized and they think this is it. And that's the reason they are miserable and the church has so many problems because they fail to grow. And the Holy Spirit is supposed not only to convert you, justification, but to grow you, sanctification. And you don't hear that preached in the church. How often do you hear about sanctification? People just don't like the subject. Ah, oh, brother, if we love one another and love Jesus. Yes, we are supposed to love Jesus. But if you love Jesus, you grow. If Jesus lives in you, the Bible says that you know them by their Fruits. What is that? Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit. If you are filled by the Spirit, there will be fruits. If you don't have fruits, it means that it's all just words. When Jesus lives in you, there will be fruits. 
How many times do we talk about growth? The Holy Spirit does the sanctification in you. You cannot do it. But the Holy Spirit can and will do it. If you pray daily and if you are daily filled by the Spirit, you will grow. It's not your effort that will grow you. It's God's presence that will grow you to victory. That's the reason you are called to invite his presence daily. So there is growth. Because if you don't grow, you are sick. If your baby doesn't grow, you go to the doctor. Shouldn't we in the church grow? We never talk about that. We don't even like the subject. And if you talk about that, many people will tell you, oh, it's impossible to grow. It's not. Nothing. I can do all things in Christ. If you are in Christ, growth happens. And then the Holy Spirit will convince you of, convict you of judgment. What is that? The Holy Spirit does the whole process. When you meet Jesus, justification, and you are converted, when you grow more and more and more, and judgment, the glorification, it takes you from conversion to salvation, the whole process by the power of God. That's the reason you need to be continually filled by the Spirit because the process has to keep happening. Any moment in this process, you can be right here. If you are destitute of oil, you lose everything you have done. You are supposed to be filled with oil throughout the process. You are never good enough to be in heaven unless you are filled with oil. That's the reason five of them perishes. Not because they didn't go to church. Not because they didn't return tight. It's because they failed at a certain point to be filled with oil. They stopped the process. They separated from God. There is no salvation. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He who has Christ has life. He who has no Christ has no life. Period. So in this process, we have the tendency at a certain point to think that we are there and fail to seek his presence as we did when we got baptized. We desperately need to seek his presence at every point in the process. Nobody, regardless where, could be at the general conference or member. Nobody is safe without being filled with the Holy Spirit. You follow me? That's our safety. And then you need to think about this. The Holy Spirit, when he comes, he doesn't only convince you, but he enables you for service. People that are filled with God's presence, they don't need to make efforts to convince somebody. God's presence in them has power and influence. Simply the fact that you are continually praying it's strong enough that God can use you. It's not what you do or who you are. It's God's presence in you that does the work. And then we wonder why we struggle with our families. This is the answer. Think about this. Abraham has commanded his house. How do you think he did that? You better do it, I'm going to beat you. That's how he did He walked with God and God's presence in him. When Isaac, that he was about 17, 18, 19, I don't know, Abraham took him to sacrifice him. Isaac was big. Abraham was old. 120. Isaac would have said, leave me alone, old man. Why would he allow his father to sacrifice him? God's presence in Abraham's life was so strong that people respected when he said something, they did it. I remember my father. I didn't understand much of what he said in the beginning. But he was such a loving, such a holy man, that when he says something, I did it out of respect for him and love for him. His influence was so strong. When you walk with God, you influence everybody you get in touch with. You follow me? And so that's what we actually miss. Anyway, I'm not going to continue because our time is up. I wanted to give you a few quotations that are absolutely powerful. By the way, um, a few stories. I, uh, I have a few stories here. Some of them are really powerful. We don't have time for all of them. Um, one of the stories that is really nice, <coughs> it's, I don't know if you have heard it, but there, there, there was a group of Adventist people in Siberia, in Russia, working in the oil fields, very cold, minus 50, minus 60 Fahrenheit, 
when I was in Norway, I remember days when it was minus 55, minus 56 outside. And uh, you cannot imagine how cold it is. My wife and I would go out, and instantly when we would try to breathe, our nostrils would stick up together like this, and we, we could not breathe unless to our mouth because it was so cold. Anyway, and so they were in Russia, in Siberia, in, mine, in, in, in oil fields. And their church had about 80 members, and it went down to roughly eight, nine people. In about two years, they were closing the church. So they talked, and they said, we are hopeless. We are going to close the church. What can we do? Because nobody comes here. So they talked, and they said, the single uh, thing that we can do is to pray together for the Holy Spirit. So they got together and prayed. But in the day, they worked in the oil fields. In the night, they came inside around the fireplace. Outside cold, inside warm, tired after a whole day working. Guess what happened when they got together to pray? They all fell asleep. All. And they were ashamed of themselves. Hey, we want you to pray, but we fell asleep. They woke up after like two hours. Oh, we got to go tomorrow morning early. We go to work. Next evening, they got together. They fell asleep. Next evening, they got together. They fell asleep. And they said, shame on us. And one of them said, we don't love Jesus. Oh, no, we do. No, we don't. Because when we go fishing, nobody falls asleep. People watch a movie, they don't fall asleep. Well, some do. People go fishing, they don't fall asleep. People meet together with friends, they don't fall asleep. But when they go to prayer and study, they fall asleep. Because their mind is not in it. And he says, when we go fishing, we don't fall asleep. So why don't we go fishing praying? So he said, I'm going to see you. Usually they go fishing on Sunday mornings at 4 a.m. They would go on the lake, frozen lake. And they would cut a circle in the ice and fish in that ice hole. You know? So he said, I'm going to see you tomorrow morning, 4 a.m. at the lake. He cut the circle in the ice, and he said, anybody who falls asleep, I want you to go in the frozen water so you'll never fall asleep praying. <laughs> and he had a petition for them to sign that they agree. If they fall asleep, they will get in the water. And they all signed to show their commitment to prayer, they said, we love Jesus more than sleep, more than job, more than anything. We are going to sign the petition. If somebody would fall asleep again, we get in the ice. They signed the petition. They got around the ice, on the ice, around the circle, where they would go fishing without a fishing line. And they started to pray on ice. They said, if we can fish for two hours here, why don't we pray for two hours here? And they prayed. Tomorrow morning, 4 a.m. on the ice. Next morning, 4 a.m. on the ice. Tell me, is that easy? It takes commitment. After a few months of praying around the ice, their church went back up to 80. And they said, our church is full, we have no more seats, should we stop? And one of them says, why? <laughs> we just experienced God's power, why not continue? So they kept praying. They planted five more churches in five towns around Murmansk. All together, six churches, because they kept praying on the ice. Isn't that powerful? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you. This is not a sermon. Why don't you get a group of people and pray together? Do it. Do it. I give you another example. One of the pastors, one of my friends told me this example. A lady, her name, pretty difficult to pronounce, Hoyanji has the largest church, largest church in China, 7,000 members. Persecution, ready to be arrested many times, the police comes. Several cameras, about 26 cameras put by the police in the church to watch everything they say, everything they do. If they say anything that is dubious, they get arrested. This lady said, how can we preach in a communist country and baptize people when it's against the law? What can we do to reach the country? So she invited a few ladies, about 10 of them, at 4 a.m. at the church. And she says, we are going to get together and do what Jesus says, pray in one accord for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then she says, in the interview with my friend, the pastor, she says, he asked her, what is the secret of your success? And she said, I've seen the cross. 
That's what she said. He said, I've seen the cross. And when I understood what God has done for me to save me, no sacrifice would be too great for him. And she says, I understand that I cannot do it because it's a communist government. I have no power. I have no means. I have no money. But I'm going to pray for the Holy Spirit. And she says, we get together and pray for the Holy Spirit. That's what she said. And they prayed every morning from four to six. After several months of prayer, their church got up to 7,000. It started with about 150. Got up to 7,000 members. They kept praying, but they said, if we got to 7,000 members by praying from 4 to 6, what if we pray from 4 to 9? <laughs> and they started to pray from 4 to 9 a.m. in turns. People would come pray one hour and leave. Somebody else would come pray one hour and leave. And their prayer group increased from about 10 to 150 people praying from 4 to 9 a.m. And their church went to 20,000 members. And they said, what if we increase from 4 to 6 p.m., from 4 a.m. to 6 p.m.? And people would come in tours of one hour and pray and go. And they planted 380 churches. 300. This lady, with her group praying, planted 380 churches in China. Is it possible? My friend who told me the story, he has the pictures with them and the interview and so on and so forth. Another story, and we are going to finish with that one. Another lady that she went to the neighbor. She said, how can I, she prayed, how can I reach my neighbors? She went to the neighbor and said, neighbor, I made two breads. One for me, one for you. It's a wonderful homemade bread. Listen, do you think that the neighbor is going to turn down a bread? You come and give me a bread. See if I turn it down. <laughs> I went to my neighbors with tomatoes. Do you think they turned it down? They all took it. And then she said, can I pray for you? Also in China. And the neighbor says, uh, yeah. What do you want me to pray for? Uh, pray for my health. And then next day to the next neighbor. Hey, I made two breads. <laughs> one for me, one for you. I came to give you a fresh, warm, nice bread. Can I pray for you? Yeah, pray for my job. Next day, next day, she went to about 20 neighbors. And then after she finished, she started all over again from the first one. Hey, I came back with the bread. And then after she finished all 20, she started all over third time to the first one. And when she finished, guess what? Again and again. After about three, four trips, getting to everybody three, four times, you know what happened? When you pray for somebody and you say, what do you want me to pray for? and people open their heart and tell you their struggles, and you listen, and then you pray for them. What happens? Relationship. Those people in our society, nobody cares. Nobody listens. Not even friends. They don't take the time to listen. They say, how are you doing? And if you try to tell them how you are doing, they are busy. Nobody cares. When you listen and you pray for them, people know that you care and they can trust you. He built friendship. People started to open their hearts to her and say, why are you different? What do you believe? Tell us. Why do you have joy? Why do you have peace? Why do you care? Tell us. And she invited them over to her house. But there was no room. They started to do Bible studies. They all got baptized. And then she says, Lord, what can I do? We already have 80 people in my house every Sabbath. 80 people in a small house. So God impressed her to sell the house. She sold the house. She says, what do I do next? And God says, you see that big house? Buy it. She went there, and the house was four times the price she got for her house. She said, I don't have the money. And God said, go back and tell the man, why do you buy the house? She went back. She says, I need a big house, but I don't have the money. How many people you have in your family that you need such a big house? Zero. I am alone. <laughs> why do you need a big house? I have about 80 neighbors that we pray together for people who are in need. And he got tears in his eyes and says, how much money do you have? I'm going to give you the house for that money. And the lady kept praying with the neighbors, giving them bread, and then inviting them, and all the others going into the neighborhoods, and I think you get the rest of the story. You follow me? These are real stories, real people, real names in our days. The bottom line is not these stories. The bottom line is that prayer has power. And prayer, even if doesn't, things don't happen right away, if you pray and next month nothing happens, 
you get the benefit of spending time with God. You get the benefit of being transformed. Your family gets the blessing. Your church gets the blessing. By doing that, your church is transformed. By doing that, you grow closer and closer to Jesus. Shouldn't we do that? That's what five virgins didn't do. They did go to church. Our people have a tendency to think because they go to church, they are okay. Hey, Many people go to church and Jesus is going to say, I don't know you. We are not okay unless we have an honest, continual, deep relationship with Jesus. We are not okay. Nobody is okay. If you think you are okay, I feel sorry for you. You follow me? Nobody is okay. And so, we, we need to finish right now. Uh, before we finish, do you have questions? I didn't go to the presentation. In fact, it's 137 slides. Should I put a few quotations from the Spirit of Prophecy about the Holy Spirit? Do you want to read a few? I do have plenty. Okay. Hold on a second. Okay. I, I'm, I'm looking for the quotations. I think I already found a few. Not yet. Okay, starting with this very well known, you know this quotation, don't you? Select, me Select message, volume 1, page 121. What does he say at the end? A revival needs to be expected only, only in answer to? You see, this is what we need to understand. Without the Holy Spirit, a knowledge of the word, what we do have a lot of knowledge of the Bible, don't we? We are experts in theory. It's of no avail. The truth without the Holy Spirit cannot change the heart. One may know the commandments, but unless the Holy Spirit would change, the character will never be transformed. Next one. In the parable, all ten virgins went to meet the bridegroom. There is no difference between them. So with the church before the second coming. All know the scripture. All go to church. All sing Kumbaya. But... Some of them are destitute of the Holy Spirit. This is the problem. They, they have been content. I want you to read this. This is powerful. They have been content, satisfied with the superficial work. They don't know God. Their service degenerates into forms. That's having the lamp without the oil. Degenerates into forms. At the final day, many will claim admission. But they have not entered into fellowship with Christ. Wow. The fellowship of the Spirit, which you have neglected, could alone prepare you for the marriage feast. Now, if we jump a little, because there are too many quotations. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. This is another strong one. Let me jump a little more. Look here. How rarely... This subject, the Holy Spirit, is presented before our people. In consequence of this silence, of this most important thing, this is the most important subject, the Holy Spirit. This is the most important subject. The promise of the Holy Spirit is casually brought in our discourses. This is what is essential to the church to grow this is actually missing. If all would be willing to receive the Holy Spirit, all would be filled with the Spirit. This subject is absolutely essential. <clears throat> Minor matters occupy our attention. And the divine power that is necessary for growth and prosperity would bring all other blessings. It's lacking. This is powerful quotation, isn't it? If God was to bless his church in the last day, 
It will be because the doctrine of the Holy Spirit will not only be studied, but sought after with the whole heart. Ministers and congregations will be found bowing down together with one cry. We have sinned because we have tried to be Christians without the Holy Spirit. Now, Charles Spurgeon says, if we don't have the Holy Spirit, it would be better to close our churches. If the pastors don't have the Holy Spirit, they should not even preach. I don't speak too strong when I say a church without the Spirit is a curse rather than a blessing. Since this is the means by which you receive power, why don't we hunger for the Spirit? Why don't we pray for the Spirit? Why don't we talk about the Spirit, preach about the Spirit? The Lord is more willing. And then he says, for the daily, this is the key of the wise virgins, daily. For the daily baptism of the Holy Spirit, every worker should offer petitions. Company of Christians, groups, should gather together, two or three, and pray for, especially that the Lord would baptize the church with a rich measure of the Spirit. It's clear, isn't it? And the great and measureless gift of the Holy Spirit are contained all heaven resources. It's not because of any restriction on God's side that we don't receive it. This promise belongs, if claimed by faith, would bring all other blessings. We did read that. The reception of the Holy Spirit in its fullness is the greatest need of the church today. Let's pray for it. There is no limit to the usefulness of one who put himself aside makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit. There is no limit. God can do anything. No limit. Near the close of probation, a special bestowal of the Holy Spirit will be poured over the church. Now listen carefully. It is for this power that, this, that the Christians should pray. If there was ever a time when we need the Holy Spirit, it is now. And I have more and more and more quotations. I'm going to stop now. My voice is not so good. I already talked too much. But you get the message. Why don't we get together and pray for the Holy Spirit? Now listen carefully. You don't pray for the Holy Spirit just because you want to have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't come just because you want the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to do a job that you cannot do. Basically, the disciples were given a mission. And you're supposed to ask for the Holy Spirit to enable them to do that mission. You don't pray, Lord, I would like to have the Holy Spirit. Why? Uh, do you do something in the church? No. Do you do something for your neighbor? No. I just want to have the Holy Spirit. No, it doesn't work that way. The Holy Spirit comes to change you. The Holy Spirit comes when you say, Lord, I want to change, I want to save my kids, but they don't listen to me. Give me your Holy Spirit to work with them. The Holy Spirit comes to enable you to do the work that God gave you to do. Lord, I want to reach the city. I want to, but I cannot do it. We cannot do it. So you pray that the Holy Spirit enables you to do the job that God gave you to do. That's when the Holy Spirit comes. Because it's for service. Remember, ten virgins. The Holy Spirit comes when you are willing to serve. If you are not willing to serve, you can pray forever for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you understand? And God calls you to serve. And God calls you to pray. And it's amazing what Ellen White says. She says, God doesn't need us. He called us to serve because the more we work for others, the more we grow spiritually, the more we become like Jesus. Only by service you grow. You understand? Anyway, let's stop. Let's stop. <clears throat> yeah. When, uh, when I was uh, here in America, I talked to one of my friends, good friend, really good friend of mine. We knew each other for a long time. He uh, is in Carolina, and he... Um, He used to, I was an engineer before I was a pastor, and he was an engineer before he was a pastor. We are both from Romania, and uh, because of the persecution and because of the hardship, we uh, had to pray. We had no choice. I mean, you had to either compromise or give up everything or pray, because otherwise you would not make it. We had to pray. And so he was in a city somewhere in the middle of the country in the mountains, when the revolution came, I was in south of the country by the border with former Yugoslavia. And when the revolution started, it started in the west of the country, in a city called Timisoara, big city, 1.5, close to 1.8 million people. Big universities, a lot of schools, a lot of nice big city, many uh, cathedrals, many uh, nice city. When the revolution started, Ceausescu, the dictator, the president, ordered the police and the army to shoot people in the head. 
literally, there were shooters on all buildings. And as soon as you get in the street to protest, people would fall with a hole in their heads. My father-in-law came home from work, crawling between bodies, and he told us, as soon as you would get up, you would be shot. He had to crawl on his tummy between dead bodies because he was afraid when he gets up, boom, you know, done. Tanks rolled over the students protesting, literally over human flesh. Tanks rolled, got the human bodies under. And so thousands of people perished when the revolution started. In that moment, my friend was meeting with the youth from his church, repeating, practicing for the Christmas program. And they were practicing for quite a few months. And he talked to them and he says, people are dying outside. And we are called to save. And we stay inside and we do nothing. And they said, are you crazy? If we go outside, we die too. <laughs> but when God talks, it doesn't make sense. You need to know him enough to be in such a relationship with him, you have been praying for so long to the degree that you know him. And when he talks to you, you don't try to understand because if you try to understand God, you'll never obey God. You just trust him. So my friend said, let's pray about it. They prayed and he says, I sense strongly that God wants us to go out. And they said, if you go between the protesters and the police and the army, you'll get killed. He says, well, God died for us. Let's go outside and die for him. And they said, are you crazy if we go outside? What's going to happen to us? And they prayed again and again and again. And it was kind of a debate. They prayed and prayed and prayed. And they were strongly inspired to go outside. Now, during communism, you would not ever hear religious songs in the radio or TV or in public. As soon as you'll try to sing or to preach, you'll be arrested. So they said, God wants us to go outside and sing to the city, to the, to the fighters, to the army and to the police. <laughs> That's crazy. In a communist country, you don't sing to the police that he's shooting people, you know. That's absolutely crazy. So they prayed and they got in the street. And they started to sing Christmas songs about Jesus coming to bring peace and salvation. When they started to sing, for one moment, everybody froze. The police, the army, the protesters, everybody just froze there. They have never heard anything like that in public. Moreover, during the shooting, everybody stopped. After a few seconds, the police came and picked them up. Took them to the next building on the shopping center on the roof. Now they knew what was going to happen. The police had a habit to throw protesters off the buildings. I took a student in my car that was thrown from the architecture building from the fifth story on the concrete. He hit the concrete, I took him, put him in my car, drove him to hospital. Before I got to hospital, he died in my car. So we knew when the police takes you on a roof, that's what happens. They throw you off the roof. So the police took the choir, the Adventist choir, on the roof of the shopping center. And they knew, this is it, we are done. And the chief of police says, this is amazing. Can you explain it to me how in the world, when you started to sing, everybody froze? What did you do that everybody just stopped instantly? Nobody was shooting, nobody was... Everybody stopped. What did you do? And they said, well, this is the power that God has over people. And the police says, we don't get it, but it works. <laughs> and the chief of police says to one of the officers, take the SUV, go to the police station, bring the sound system and the biggest speakers that you can find right away. The guy took the SUV, brought the speakers and the sound system, put them on the roof of the shopping center, and he says, I want you to sing. So the killing stops. So they started to sing from the rooftop. And they say, my friend says that people on the street stopped, they kneeled down in a communist country, that's amazing, and they raised their hands and they started to praise God and to sing and to pray and to cry. And then they got up and they went to one another, police and protesters, and hugged one another and they started to cry and ask forgiveness. And in that city, the fighting stopped. Isn't that something? Because a group of young people we're praying. Amen. So listen, folks. As we finish this, this afternoon, we started at 2 and it's 4. Too long. Don't come and be listeners. Be doers. 
make a decision. You probably already wake up early in the morning and pray and study. If you don't, make a decision that you are going to do it from now on. If you do, increase it. When you do that, don't do as a duty. It's easy to study. Ellen White says, don't read a lot. She says, take two, three verses. She says, two, three verses at a time. And then she says, read them again and again. Meditate upon them. She says, reflect on them. Pray over them. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand them. Ask what would God want me to understand. And then she says, seek to know him and his will. Read a little and pray over it. Try to know what he wants you to understand. Try to know him. Try to make it meaningful, not only to do a duty, but rather to digest it, to chew it. You follow me? To, to dig deep into it. Pray over it. Read it again. Think it. Read it again. Pray again. Seek with the desire to know God, to know what he wants, to know who he is, because that's life. That's what's going to change you. Not the fact that you do your duty reading five chapters a day. Try to eat it. Do you follow me? That's what Jesus says, eat my body, drink my blood. Try to, to really inhale it and pray over it. And make sure that you pray and study with the goal to be filled with his presence and to know him. Pray over your families. Get in the habit to pray with your families. Invite them in the morning, in the evening. Have the altar together. My father did that with me. I did that with our kids. It has a powerful effect. When you call them and you don't give them a sermon and you don't give them a boring theory, you tell them a story and you have a prayer together. It's amazing when they pray, not only you. As people open their hearts and pray, they unite. It brings unity in the family. Have, have prayer in the family. Get together in groups and pray for the church. Pray for the city. God called you to save the city. It's not too big. This city can be saved. This city can be saved. Pray for the city. God can do it. Don't doubt God. He's going to amaze you when you pray. He's going to do bigger than you think. Pray for the city. Don't lose time. You will get a blessing. You will be the one to actually benefit from it. So act on it. If it doesn't happen, don't stop. Just keep praying. You will not be sorry. Because in time, when you are ready, God works with people, but when they are ready, when you are ready, God is going to do it. Just get together and pray. Okay?